for what God has said. We don't need to be uncertain. We can have the truth on these things when we pay attention carefully to what is in the word. We can be sure. Now, Luke also wrote Acts. So turn over to Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. And there we're going to see what, uh, what Luke has told us there at the beginning of that book. It says, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So what we, we see Luke saying is, after talking about, he'd already written about the life of Jesus, that of course was written so we could know that the things that were taught about Jesus were true by studying the gospel. In Acts, as Luke starts to talk about what happens at Jesus' ascension and the early church afterward, he says, Christ, life, Christ's resurrection has many infallible proofs. Infallible. It's not something there's anything wrong with. It's not something that is going to lead doubt. These are proofs, and they're real, and they're true, and you can know that. We don't have to say, well, I think Jesus rose from the dead. More likely than not, Jesus rose from the dead. Quite possibly, probably Jesus rose from the dead. No, we can know that through the evidences given. And of course, we have the empty tomb. We have the miracles done by Jesus and by his followers. We have the complete revelation, which testifies to that in such harmony. We have the fulfilled prophecies, like we're studying about on Sunday morning now. We have the information. We have these infallible proofs, and they're enough to overcome any honest question or doubt that people might have. We have that. That's why Acts was written, going along with why, why Luke was written. We have enough for an honest heart to believe. And if you'll turn over just a little bit before Acts chapter 1 to John chapter 20 and verses 30 through 31, we see why we've been given these things. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. What Jesus did was written down so that we could understand it, we could believe it, and as a result, we could have life. So we've got the testimony in Luke uh, and Acts about the life of Jesus and his resurrection. We have here in John chapter 20, just after telling us of Jesus' resurrection, we have why these things were told to us so that we could believe and have life. The Bible is given so that we can be certain. And the Bible does not ask us, well, be certain about this because I'm telling you this without any evidence. No. Many infallible proofs. His actions recorded. These things written by eyewitnesses. The Bible gives us evidence so that we can know. We can believe. And believe not based on a whim or a feeling, but on what God has shown us in his word. That's what we see in the Bible. And as we see three of the first books of our New Testaments, it tells us that. It makes it very clear. But also in the Old Testament, we can see similar things said about God and his word. Look with me, please, at 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 31. 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 31. As David is toward the end of his life, as it's recorded here, he tells us something about God. In verse 29, he talks about how the Lord, Jehovah, is his lamp, gives him the strength to succeed. And it says in verse 31, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. David says the word of the Lord is proven and David had lived it. Had David not believed in the promises of God, he is not going to that brook and getting five small stones and facing Goliath without believing that, yes, the word of God is proven. And when David had faith, he did receive the reward for that faith. He was able to succeed because God gave him strength. He believed in the proven word of God, and he was able to find success because of it. We can have certainty if we have the kind of faith that David did.
But we need to have a certainty and an understanding that comes through study of the word. It's not something that we just, you know, intuitively decide. We need to be willing to understand it through a careful study of it. Look over at Nehemiah, and I'm sorry, that's chapter 8 of Nehemiah, not chapter 2. And in Nehemiah, chapter 2, we see what's being said. Now, this comes near the end of the time of the Old Testament, in which they have... Uh, Nehemiah has come, he's come trying to get the wall built, and he's succeeded in this. And now the people are worshiping there, and they're hearing the law being read. And in chapter 8, starting in verse uh, verse 3, it says, and this is Ezra, although Nehemiah is also there, then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday, before the men and women and, and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Who came there? In verse 2 and 3, it shows us all who could hear with understanding. Men coming, women coming. With that, we would I would assume also older children would be there. Everybody who could understand was there, and everybody who could understand needed to understand. Not only that, but those who are reading were helping people understand. In verse 8, so they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. So there were those who were reading who were helping others understand. They were going to listen to what God was saying, and they, were, they pleased him when they did what he said. They were helped to understand. They understand. They took it seriously, and they obeyed. Does this mean that they never had the opportunity to fall away? Well, they had that opportunity, and not all of them did all that they should have done. But we do see that they were given the opportunity to understand through a careful hearing of God's word. Look over with me at Psalm 119, the 119th Psalm, and look at that Psalm in which so much is said about the word of God. In Psalm 119, 104, we see an important principle given us about understanding God's word. Psalm 119, verse 104 says, Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. The psalmist could know what was true and what he needed to understand through God's precepts given in his word. And because of it, he hated what was wrong. It wasn't just that I'm going to believe this, but I'm not going to stand against anything else. No, he knew what was right and he knew what was wrong, certain about both, from God's word. We live in a society where they, people want to say, well, it's okay to, be, to think you're right, but you better not think anybody else is wrong. Well, I don't want to go hating people. I don't want to go threatening people. But if people are wrong about things that affect their eternal salvation, love should compel me to try to help them understand that. doesn't mean I'm hateful. But it does mean that I take the word of the Lord seriously and try to help others. Now, right after verse 104, where he talks about understanding through God's precepts, right after that in verse 105, it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If you walk around in the dark very much, well, if you walk around too much in the dark, you're probably going to bump into things or trip over things, right? But if you have a light, then you can go around with confidence. God's word is the confidence. We don't have to be uncertain. If you ever walked around a dark room, you might start feeling around. Now, where's the wall? Where's the knob? Where's the switch? Where's the corner of the bed so I don't jam my toes on it and so forth? You know that that's, you feel uncertain a good bit. But with God's word, we can have the kind of certainty that we need. And just a few more pages from there is Proverbs chapter 2. It becomes clear that a godly wisdom, a biblical wisdom, comes from those who make the effort to understand God's word. It says, my son, if you receive my words... And treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. It doesn't come from, you know, sitting around and trying to let it wash over you while you're doing something else. It doesn't come from, you know, a halfway attention. It doesn't come from casually every so often hearing a little bit. It comes from attention 
It comes from concerted effort to listen to and to apply God's word. Wisdom comes to those who make the effort to understand. You know, sometimes when I was in school, people would talk about studying by osmosis. Osmosis when biology means if you have, for instance, a thin membrane, you can have water and other things in the water go in and out of that membrane, even though it might seem pretty solid at first, there are things that can kind of move their way in and out through it. And some people did seem to try to study in osmosis when they fell asleep with their head in or on the book. And if the words could have traveled off the page and through their skull and into their brain, I suppose that might have worked. But it didn't. Because you can't learn without making the effort to understand when it comes to these things. With God's word, you need to make the effort, pay attention to it. And we were wanted to understand. God wants us to. Look over at Matthew chapter 15 and verse 10. What Jesus said here fits with what he says afterward. He says in verse 10, when he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear and understand. Now think about what Jesus is saying. He says you need to listen. But you can understand when you listen. And that goes on throughout the context here. If you look at verse 11, he, he says something that at first is not easy to understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Well, that's different than what some of them were expecting. And they thought of cleanliness and defilement in terms of, of the various things that we might see in parts of Leviticus, for instance, what's going to be clean and what's going to be unclean. But Jesus says there's something much more than that. What, you come, what comes out of your mouth comes from your heart. If you have a heart that is clean spiritually, that is going to be key to being clean in all of the other ways. And Jesus, of course, was bringing a new covenant in which pork would not make you unclean if you ate it. But having the wrong attitude of heart under each covenant especially though Jesus emphasizes this under the New Testament, would make you unclean if you are going to harbor that kind of evil in your heart. If you are going to have bitterness and grudges and evil thoughts about others, if you are going to keep these things in your heart, eventually they would come out of your mouth and may issue in gossip or slander or hateful speech in other ways. So what's in your heart makes you unclean in the more important and lasting way is what Jesus says here. He wants them to understand this. And as he goes on in verses 12 through 14, we see that his disciples didn't understand this at first. Well, not only that, but in verses 12 through 14, they tell him, yeah, there were Pharisees and, and, and they were offended by this. And Jesus makes the point. They didn't understand because they weren't willing to think about it. They weren't willing to discard some of the things they like to think that were wrong and really accept this as the truth as it was. There were people, there were Pharisees who would listen to what Jesus said and accept it and throw out the things they thought that were wrong. We read about them in Acts 15. We read about Paul, who was a Pharisee, who changed a lot of his thinking. But then even later on, Peter also doesn't understand it. And Jesus tells him he needs to understand. Jesus tells him in the following verses through verse 20 that it admonishes him. You need to understand this. So we see that Jesus says this and then illustrates it. He wants people to understand, but it's going to take some work. It's going to take effort. It's going to take examining carefully what is said. If you're willing to do all those things, then you can understand God's word. But if you're only willing to look at the verse 11 or so forth and say, huh, I don't know what that means, and then go off like it doesn't matter, then you're not going to understand God's word. It takes effort. Look over at John chapter 8 and verse 43. When Jesus is having a discussion, when he is even being opposed by some of the same kind of people, Pharisees, that we read about over here in Matthew 15, in John chapter 8, verse 43, he tells them what the problem is, why they don't understand. He says, why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. It wasn't that their ears were the problem. It wasn't that they didn't know the language. But they weren't willing 
to discard the things that were wrong in favor of the things that were right when Jesus showed that to them. The lack of understanding came from an unwillingness to listen fully. Do you listen? Do we listen to God's word? Do we listen in a way that lets it come in, that we think about it deeply and allow it to become a part of us? Does it have our attention throughout our lives? When we're reading it at home, sure. When we're here studying, sure. But as we go about our lives, are we thinking about how do I make application of this? What is this telling me? You know, if we're influenced by the world, let's say we're influenced by the world to believe that there is no absolute truth. But we start listening to what Jesus said, and when we think about it, we realize that Jesus is saying something different. And what Jesus says has a lot better evidence than the people who say there's no absolute truth but seem to think that the only absolute truth is that there is no absolute truth, which doesn't make sense. We've got to be willing to listen carefully and make application. And even things that God has revealed to us that we couldn't have known on our own, they can be understood because he's revealed them to us. We have to look to him for that understanding. Look over at Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 3 through 6. Paul's going to talk about the mystery of God here. Now, the mystery of God wasn't something that someone who was really smart or really clever would just get on their own, would just think of on their own, but it was something that God had given from his word that they needed to understand. He says this in starting in verse 3 of Ephesians 3. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of, of his promise in Christ through the gospel. There was something new that was being revealed in Christ, and it was that the Gentiles were going to be part of God's body of people just like the Jews. Now this was a surprise to a number of people because they had grown up having it emphasized to them, you know, we're the Jews, we follow God's law, they're the Gentiles, they don't. And it was easy to let that become sort of a, a prejudice against them that would be a long-lasting thing. It was easy, of course, to think that if they were obeying the law now, that they weren't going to obey the law, or that they never would obey the law. But that's not what God was saying. There were, in the Old Testament, references to people in various places listening to God's word and coming to him. So there were, there were things that, of course, fit with what was being revealed in Christ very well, but it was something that was not made known until Christ made it known, that he died so that all could be one in him, as chapter 2 of Ephesians discusses at length. And so Paul says, this is something that God revealed through his word, and when you listen to when you are willing to think about this and study this, then you can understand what God has said. If you weren't willing to put in the effort, you wouldn't understand this. But Paul says you can. God has made it so that you can, even though it wasn't revealed before and people couldn't have come up with this on their own. You can understand it when you look carefully at what is being taught and make it a part of your life. So we can be certain of that truth. We can because God makes it so that we can understand it and we can know what he wants us to know and we can be certain of it. Look over with me, please, at Hebrews chapter 4 because our third point is that the word that God has given us has the power to tell us what we need to know about God's word and about our own obedience or disobedience to God's word if we apply it carefully. So in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, 
and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God's word is a tool. It is a precision instrument beyond any precision instrument that man might have and use in medicine or other ways. It will show us the truth and it will show us whether we have obeyed that truth or not if we listen to it and if we apply it. If we, as we'll see, if we don't do anything with it, it's not going to help us. But if we're keenly interested in letting it shape us, correct us, direct us, then it will do that perfectly for the intent that God has given it. So look over also at just a short distance from there, excuse me, over at James chapter 1, a few pages over. James chapter 1 also illustrates this and how the fact that we need to use God's word if we're going to be helped by God's word. In James chapter 1, and verses 23 and 25, it tells us this. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So if we look into the mirror of God's word, it's a perfect mirror. It's not dim. It's not smudged. It's perfect, and it'll show us if there's something about us spiritually that's a mess. It will help us clean that up. But what do we have to do? Well, we have to look and then decide to act on it. You look in a mirror, and you're a mess, and you say, how about that? You walk away. You won't be any cleaner. And some people do that with God's word. Okay, that's what the Bible says. That's fine. Okay, I'll go do whatever I've been doing or whatever I want to do, and they get no cleaner. But if we look at it and we're willing to do what it says, being a doer of the word and not just a hearer, and we don't forget, but we make an effort to obey it, then we will be what God wants it to be. And that doesn't stop when we become Christians. It's something we continually need to be doing. Because even after we're Christians, Satan is still trying to get us to sin. And sometimes he may succeed in getting us to sin in ways that through a little bit of laziness or carelessness that we don't really pay that much attention to in ourselves. That's why if we look hard at the mirror, God will show us and we can fix what's wrong and be right in his sight. The word does that if we use it properly. So again, remember too, we can use the word of God. Ephesians 6, 17 calls it the sword of the spirit, the word of God, the sword of the spirit. And we can use it to show other people what is right. And when we say the sword of the spirit, we're not physically out to hurt them in the least, but we want to show them by God's word what is right so that they can turn to it and be saved. Can we make them change? No, can't make them change, can't make them do good. But we can use God's word to lovingly show them as clearly as possible what they must do to be right with him. Look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 4 and 5, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 4 and 5. There we read this. For we are not overextending ourselves as our authority did not extend to you. I'm sorry, that's chapter there's verse 14, verses 4 and 5 in chapter 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We think about looking at a mirror like we talked about in James, and we, we're looking at ourselves in the mirror usually. And the word of God can help us cut away what is wrong and keep what's right. But the word can also fight against the false arguments that people make. When people want to claim various things in this world that are not true, we have the word of God and we can use it and we can show what really is right against the false arguments that are being made. Whether it's by the false arguments of false teachers or the false arguments of, of the popular psychology of the world. People believe what is convenient for them 
or believe what makes them feel good in the short term instead of what's really right and helps in the long term, we can defeat those arguments. We can defeat those arguments in the world and we can defeat them within ourselves if Satan is trying to convince us of these things. The word, the word helps us detect and destroy the false arguments. And over in chapter 13 and verse 5, Paul says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? If people are not finding the errors that they have, if Christians are not finding the errors that they have within themselves, then they're not using the word fully and properly. We can know the truth. We can know whether we're, what we're doing is right or wrong. And we can be pleasing to God in that way. The word is a diagnostic tool. And the word is even much better than some of the diagnostic tools we think about. You know, you have a stethoscope at the doctor's office. Listen to that heartbeat. That's great. It's a good tool. It's a simple tool. It's a painless kind of tool to use. It's a good thing, but it's not going to fix anything. The word of God does. It goes beyond diagnosis to actually solving the spiritual problems that we have. Some people don't find their errors because they don't use the word properly. And if you turn over to 2 Peter chapter 3, we also see that sometimes people don't put forth the effort to approach the word carefully and be established in the truth. 2 Peter 3 verse 14. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they also do the rest of the scriptures. If we don't make an effort to ensure we're using the scriptures properly, we could end up misleading ourselves and others from Second Peter chapter 2. And there are some things that are going to be hard. They're not going to be easy. It's not something that you're going to resolve in five minutes or less. The Bible doesn't say that everything is just going to be absolutely simple to understand immediately. But when we make the effort, we can know what will please God. And we can be right with him. But we've got to be willing to make the effort. At school, and there are other places it happens to, at school I run into students who just think, well, this is hard. I've decided I can't do it. I'm not going to try. And unfortunately, that's an attitude people have toward the Bible as well. Ooh, this is, this is hard. It's not what I've expected. This might uh, require of me some, some sacrifice. This might require me to change. This might require me to dig deeper and understand what God really wants me to do. Wow, that sounds like a lot of work. Well, I, I'm sure it doesn't matter. And they don't change. But we can't have that attitude if we want to please God. We know that God loves us. We know that God sent his son to die for us. We know that God's given us a perfect revelation. And the least we can do is spend time with it, build ourselves up in it, and try to please God to the best of our ability as a result of reading it. At the beginning of 2 Peter, at the very beginning, it tells us just how sufficient this word is. It's enough for all our needs spiritually. It says in verse 2 of 2 Peter 1, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Yes, he's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. We have what we need. We can know about Jesus. We can know the word. We can claim the promises when we obey carefully what he has said. We can live righteously. He's given us everything we need. But we see over in Acts chapter 8 that there was someone there who knew some things but really didn't understand because he didn't have all the information that he needed. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 30, we read about an Ethiopian who is traveling back from Jerusalem and he has Isaiah with him. The Spirit leads Philip to him. And verse 30, so Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? 
and he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. So what did Philip do at that point? He preached Jesus to him. And when he had preached Jesus for him in a few verses later, we see him saying, look, here is water. What keeps me from being baptized? So many people today in the world say, oh, you know, we just can't really understand what God wants us to do. Or we can understand it, and, and we're sure that you don't need to do anything more than just believe. But that's not what this man said when he had someone who'd been brought to him by the Holy Spirit helping him understand Isaiah. He was reading a prophecy, but what was it a prophecy of? So he needed to know about Jesus. And Philip preached Jesus. And this man who was interested in what God had said in Isaiah learned about the Savior who had come to the earth, who had been like that sheep, who had been slaughtered, who had been killed as a sacrifice for the sins of mankind, who had died on the cross for Philip, for the Jews, and for this man and for everyone who would obey him. And when he did that, when he knew about Jesus and his sacrificial death, when he understood what God wanted him to do as a result of that, he was ready. Here's water. What keeps me from being baptized? And he was baptized, and he went on his way rejoicing. That's available to us today. If you don't know what the gospel says, then please, even today, let us take the time to talk with you about it. Begin learning about what God has said. There's nothing more important to know than that. Or if you have understood what Jesus did and, and what it means, and you realize, I'm not a Christian, but I need to do what this Ethiopian man did. I need to be baptized for the forgiveness of my sins, as it talks about many other places in the New Testament. Then we'd be happy to do that for you as well. Because you can be sure, you can know, and you can obey. God's word makes it so. Could we help you today? Can we teach you more about God's will? Can we, if you understand Jesus' sacrifice baptize you after you've believed and you've turned from your sins and you're willing and you're confessing Christ? Could we then baptize you for the forgiveness of your sins so that you could be a Christian and follow him? Or could we help you in any other way spiritually to help you be right with God today? If we can, then please come to the front as we stand and sing.